Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you to session five of our program. And the topic for session five is establishing and sustaining genomic learning healthcare systems. Let me introduce our two moderators, Dr. Aaron Ramos and Dr. Crystal Sosi. Aaron. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, it really is a privilege to co-moderate this session with Dr. Sosi. I will introduce our three speakers and then Dr. Sosi will moderate the discussion. As we near a close, I'll attempt a short summary of major themes and ideally proposed solutions per Terry's request. So our first speaker is Dr. Howard McLeod from Intermountain Healthcare. Howard's talk is focused on generating evidence of effectiveness and value. Thanks, Howard. Pleasure to be here and hopefully uh, slides will start appearing soon. We can see your slides. There we go, all set. Are they in the proper mode? They are. All right, great. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the learning health system approach uh, at, at Intermountain. Um, a couple of, of general comments. One of them is the institution has to want to learn um, and want to iterate and want to improve. Um, that's one of the big keys. And the second, there's a big difference between employed physicians and affiliate physicians. And we've seen even within Intermountain, um, the learning happens differently uh, depending on the engagement with the institution. So I just drop those two in there before I forget about them as we're going forward. Also, the work that I'm describing uh, reflects the, the entire eight months that I've been at Intermountain, um, but also stands on the shoulders of what Mark, Wat Mark Williams built, Steve Blyle, Lincoln Nadal, Derek Koslam, and what Nephi Walton is currently uh, uh, doing here at the institution. Um, Intermountain is, is, a, um, see, there go, is a, a large institution, um, right now 33 hospitals and um, almost 400 um, clinics that are distributed across uh, what is functionally nine states. Um, you can see the, diff the distribution there. Um, it's the, in the mountain states. So it's the, uh, the places that you're lucky to live in or uh, lucky to be able to visit uh, once or twice a, uh, a year or, or so. Um, and so it's a, a large integrated health system, a lot of value-based care, but also a lot of fee-for-service and other models uh, that, that happen within, within that. And before anyone asks, with the merger with uh, the uh, SCL healthcare system, we have both a large Cerner and a large Epic presence. Um, so, uh, uh, and no, they don't communicate very well with each, with each other. The, um, the institution um, talks about um, helping people live the healthiest lives possible. Um, and so we integrate the uh, through precision health um, aspect um, to that. Um, as very much the, the theme of what we're trying to accomplish in, with, uh, with genomics, as well as similar type, type tools. And then as a, a kind of a last background type piece, um, Intermountain Precision Genomics or Intermountain Precision Health um, is a, a, a part of this large health system. About 200 caregivers distributed across the Intermountain footprint. Um, there's clinical care that's going on. There's a, a genomics laboratory uh, doing work there, implementation work. Um, and it's some patient-driven discovery research. And a lot of the precision medicine work is in the context of value-based care um, as, as the way forward. And a lot of the learning is how do we optimize value um, as an endpoint um, as we're going forward. One, one of the last little piece is we've broken up a lot of the clinical activity into a small number of, of sectors. Um, well, not, some of them are not so small, like primary care and pediatrics. Others are, are much more focused. Um, but um, these are the areas in which we implement um, precision medicine, realizing that many of them go across uh, multiple different uh, specialties or specialty areas. Um, but that's the administrative structure when we do the top-down type of uh, work um, of going forward. And no, um, that's not a tuba uh, or a toilet um, as the model for our ICU. Um, it's there. Um, I'll briefly go over a, a couple of the, the initiatives focusing on the value and the, and the financial piece. Um, so I'm not gonna go deep into each of them, but just to highlight what they are and some of the learning that we've made that has helped us shape uh, that. Um, that's in the, in the tumor testing, the pharmacogenomics, a little bit on, on uh, multiple cancer early detection, and then finish up with um, a large population health approach and the way that that's uh, affecting the way we learn about delivering genomic care. 
you know, the cancer model is what you'd expect. Um, you have, in this case, a, a man with metastatic lung cancer. He's run out of options. There's no clear next option based on national guidelines or FDA approvals. Um, he's fit. He wants some sort of treatment. Genomic analysis identifies something that might be uh, clinically actionable, um, but there's no guidelines for that. It goes to a molecular tumor board, um, which identifies eligibility for a particular trial. Um, that, that information from the molecular tumor board is used to uh, influence um, the discussion with the insurance company to pay for that unusual situation, in this case, melanoma therapy for a lung cancer, um, and um, the, you know, things go forward. And so this sort of model, you know, a lot of the value is brought by the, the therapeutic um, evaluation by the molecular tumor board. Um, it's not adequate just to have genomic data. You need to have the medical interpretation of that data um, uh, that, that goes hand in hand with the laboratory piece in order to go forward. And um, we've shown data, others have shown data where not only is there about a doubling in survival of these patients that get a precision approach versus a standard approach, but there's a cost savings and $734 may not seem that big of a cost savings, um, um, but this, and this is total cost of care because remember we have the entire of this patient's medical care. So their total cost of care is $734 favorably when they have precision medicine. Well, that's per patient per week. So you then can scale that out um, to uh, a, a, about an $80 million savings um, that occurs per year um, in, in our, our health system. And so that's sort of data where we have genomics for a clinical reason, get the economics within our system, and then turn that back into growing the, the, um, the element of, of, uh, of application um, is, is one of the ways that we're, we're doing this uh, going forward. Uh, you know, pre, uh, neonatology is another area. Um, there's a lot of great work that's been done. I um, happen to meet, I have to mention at the bottom there that I personally feel Stephen Kingsmore deserves a statue erected somewhere of him before all he's done in this, in this field. But um, our own efforts with, at Primary Children's up in Salt Lake City um, have identified a number of different examples um, where genomics identified therapy. And one, one really pointed example is a young man had seizures, 31 hospitalizations at, at the time he was three years old. Um, we spent half, one and a half million dollars on his care. Um, genomic, uh, a rapid hole genome identified a vitamin B6 processing gene mutation, started him on high doses of over-the-counter vitamin B6, and he has not had a seizure since. Um, it's been uh, several years now. So the, the, the idea that we can do this in the, and, and if we're owning the cost of care, uh, we'd rather spend $13,000 than $1.5 million, even if it's a small number of cases that are coming through. And so again, that type of data, learning uh, from the clinical situation, having the economics, driving more care um, because we see the, the total picture is, a, is an important part of it. The pharmacogenomics piece is also important, certainly starting with anxiety, depression. It's been implemented not just in behavioral health, but also across primary care and pediatrics. Um, and that's been, been something that has been well received and is paid for um, by um, the insurance companies that we, we work with. Um, but it's also now um, where we can go and take data uh, from, for example, this is the, the infamous um, Kentucky Retired Teachers uh, uh, paper that came out earlier this year. Um, there was a, a reduction per year in direct medical charges of about $2,625 uh, per person um, in this particular trial. We went and looked at how many people would be eligible for this type of analyses based on that data. We assumed a 10% adoption rate, which is very conservative. Uh, we, we cut the savings in half, and it would still save us right out almost $50 million per year. Um, in implementation. So this kind of work where we look at um, what is out there, can we replicate it, um, can we use it, can we apply the savings, um, is a really important part of being a learning health system on the genomics side. The, the clinical care is what drives us to do it in the first place, but it's the economics that causes the, the Darth Vader's of our system um, to want to uh, play with us um, and make this happen. Um, because often the reimbursement directly may not be adequate, but the savings is being held by others within the, the health system. Um, and when that's taken into account, 
uh, we can make much better decisions for the entire health system. Closing in on these examples, um, one that we've just started up is, is with the multiple cancer early detection testing. Um, this is something where we have to be part of some of the clinical trials that were done initially that, um, and instead of doing them through the research office, we did them, did them through primary care um, because we wanted to learn how this would play out in the, in the field. We found high accuracy, high specificity. It has now changed where this is now a covered benefit. So it's not being paid for by insurance, it's being paid for by our HR department where every employee that's 50 years or older in age um, will get one test every two years, 100% covered by uh, our health system. Um, and so far uh, we've had a, about a 1% positive rate of had multiple thousands that have done the testing, about a 1% positive rate. Um, all of them have been confirmed today. So we have not had a, a false positive yet, although we did during the clinical trial. So it is possible. But again, the idea that we can see value um, in the health system, in this case for our employees, for, for our, ourselves um, and, and um, and have that as something that's implemented and covered, um, in this case, through health benefits, other cases through the insurance coverage. Um, it, it's just a way to try to make sure this sort of thing is not languishing in the journals, rather is being applied uh, for ourselves and, and, and for our patients. The, the last little piece I wanna go through is, is about something that was started as a research study. Um, it was, it was um, something called the heredogene um, it is a, it's a, um, a collaboration between Intermountain Healthcare and Deco Genetics, uh, which is owned, owned by Amgen. Um, according to the hype that the PR department put together, it's the largest genome project ever, but I would say it's not even the largest, I put the asterisks on because it's not even the largest genome project mentioned today in this meeting, um, but it's still plenty large, about up to 500,000 people, all with electronic medical record, um, uh, looking at, at the, uh, at issues of prediction, prevention, reducing cost, et cetera. So to date, um, we've enrolled uh, uh, closing in on 150,000, just over 135 as a few weeks ago. Now it's closing in on 150,000 people that are enrolled. It includes a pediatric component through primary children's as well as two other sites. Uh, we have participants from, even though we're only enrolling in the Intermountain footprint, we have participants who um, have a home address in 49 of the 50 states. So if you are from Delaware, please come visit us and enroll in the study because we hate that we're missing uh, one state uh, out of the US. Uh, general population, um, healthy folks, specialty um, enrollment, um, all going across there. One of the key things is this is not turned out to be just, just research. We're um, based on Nephi Walton's work, have a full iterative loop where when we learn something from the ACMG uh, key genes or about it's 170 genes total that we're, we're currently uh, returning, we look and we find those variants in the whole genome analysis that's being performed. We then confirm them with the patient uh, that indeed they are with orthogonous, orthog orthogonous testing uh, that indeed are real. Um, we then have a, a clinic that works with those patients, makes referrals as necessary. Um, to date, there's been about 3,700 patients that have been served clinically um, by what was a research study. And I would say based on our experience, we really should not be doing large uh, population research studies without returning results and having it turn into clinical care because the expense while, while real um, was small um, and it turned into um, not only patients' lives, um, in some cases, lives being saved, um, but uh, also um, events that were then reimbursable based on insurance, et cetera. And so again, an iteration, a learning uh, that, that helped us turn research into practice, um, which then turns around and, and informs us more um, as we're, we're, we're going forward. The, the, the saying at the bottom there, it's not enough to, to know there is risk, we must act on it. Um, I think in this day and age, there's really no reason why health systems doing research can't have that full loop. Um, it's just personal laziness on my part that I would not want to do it. Um, has nothing to do with the practicalities of what could be done. Um, and so I think that's really should be the standard of care um, that um, is happening um, going going forward. Um, Howard, and, and, that. and then the la last piece I want to um, circle back to is I mentioned we have 33 hospitals, 400 clinics. Um, 
that's um, fine to do the various things I talked about, but uh, there's a large diffusion of, of innovation that occurs on average, it's about 17 years, according to the literature, before innovation is fully infused across these systems. And geography is a major impact um, on the level of diffusion. Many of our 400 centers are in small places, um, don't, don't necessarily get visited by the, uh, the drug rep or by the, the uh, equipment rep, uh, the device rep, uh, the thing people who kind of try to dr dr uh, drive the, uh, the innovation um, from the company standpoint. And so we have a lot of activity now, um, making sure those 33 hospitals are equipped to um, administer precision medicine and to be the sounding board for the 400 affiliated uh, medical centers uh, that are distributed across these states so that a small clinic in Wyoming um, can have access uh, to uh, precision medicine expertise through telemedicine and other sources, rather than just at, a, at an approach where uh, we, we do things at, the, at our major centers uh, where you, you see the big blue dots and then everyone else is just kind of out of luck uh, because they, uh, they went to the wrong place. So anyway, I went very fast. Um, happy to, to um, take any clarifying questions and then look forward to being part of the panel uh, when, it, uh, when it goes live. Thank you, Howard. Those were some terrific examples and insights. I think keeping an eye on the time, Let's put clarifying questions in the chat so you don't forget them. And uh, Howard, you can start thinking about your responses. And we will have our next speaker, Dr. Nancy Mendelson from Optum Frontiers Therapies and Optum Health Solutions. Nancy will focus on uh, genomic learning health systems and payers. Thanks, Nancy. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for having me join you today. I'm uh, truly honored to be here. It's very exciting to see how much has happened in the last several years. And I really appreciated uh, your talk, Howard, and getting, um, getting genomics into the health system across, uh, across so many different hospitals. It's great. Um, you can go ahead and do the next slide, please. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you guys today is a little bit about um, what is United Health Group, who we are, how uh, policy is uh, developed, um, the different, just mentioned the different levels of evidence, which you guys probably understand much more than I do, and give you some examples about how we have had external engagement with genomics and rare disease, doing some um, enterprise-wide uh, data analysis and an, an ability to try and move the field forward. Because I think there's a lot going on that people just aren't aware of. And then the question that was posed to me by, uh, by Terry and Pat was, how do we leverage a genomic uh, learning health system to use data differently and support people with rare diseases, try and engage uh, the payers? And I don't think I have an answer, but I have plenty of questions. I have a few ideas and I, I would welcome everybody else's thoughts. So go ahead. Um, next slide, please. So United Health Group is two large businesses. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, we, we have two, they're very distinct um, and but complementary business platforms. It is United Health Care, which is the uh, insurance entity, and then Optum. And Optum is really a information and then technology business that tries to enable health services across multiple different um, insurance uh, businesses. So not just United Healthcare, but all kinds of insurance entities. And we, the United Health offers a full spec, off, excuse me, United Health Care offers a full spectrum of health benefits programs for people, for individuals, employers, Medicare and Medicaid. So you can do the next slide, please. Um, so what I mean by that is policy does not necessarily mean coverage. Policy influences coverage um, and coverage is determined by each insurance entity. So if we can influence uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, we will influence policy more broadly. And in fact, United Healthcare is divided up into Medicare and uh, retirement, community and state, which is generally Medicaid services, and then what we call employment and, individ and individual. That includes United Healthcare broadly, 
fully insured and administrative services only. Administrative services only are companies where United Healthcare provides the administrative capabilities for their insurance but we don't write their policy. They write their own policies. And most big companies, that's how they get their health insurance. One thing to keep in mind is United Healthcare serves about 25 million individuals in the country. Um, United Health Group serves somewhere closer to 125 million people in the country. So overall, we touch one in three Americans. And if we can influence policy as clinical geneticists more broadly at the federal level, then we can indirectly be able to um, influence more of the private insurers, those in the administrative services only. The policy itself, as you're well aware, is determined from evidence-based medicine and in general, randomized clinical controlled trials, which is very hard in genetics and particularly in rare diseases. And it's also influenced by evidence-based healthcare practice guidelines, like those that are developed by ACMG or the AAP or COG. So all of these things together influence policy, but don't, deter but don't determine it in a black and white uh, fashion. Next slide, please. So there are some things that can be done to partner with Optum and or United Healthcare overall. In general, um, I think most people know about this uh, study that was done by Grace Yang and Annie Kennedy, Grace through the Lewin Foundation and Annie through the Every uh, Life Foundation. The Lewin Group is actually an Optum company and the data that they used is the Optum data. So I think this study where they show the impact of rare disease and the importance of the, um, across the ge genetics healthcare is really moving the field because they're proving what we all know, which is that rare disease is expensive and trying to get a diagnosis is difficult. And we need to pay attention to this area because in my opinion, it's a green field. We haven't done much to take waste out of the system and try and reduce um, the healthcare costs. Next slide. Now, um, the, the same group is looking at a set of six diseases to try and compare uh, the economic impact of early diagnosis and treatment versus not. And the results of this study are pending. So they're, um, go ahead and do the next slide. And these are the seven rare diseases that they're looking at. They're gonna calculate the direct and indirect medical costs of each disease at different milestones and compare those that have had early diagnosis versus late diagnosis, those that have had treatment versus not had treatment. And there are several people in our genetics community that are participating, advising as experts. And I'm very excited about this study because I think it will hopefully have as large of an impact as their previous study. Um, next slide, please. There's also um, something that has been developed in our Optum Genomics Group um, called the Evidence Engine. And what the Evidence Engine is doing is they're working with particular labs and, um, that have developed tests and trying to prove clinical utility. So um, it's real world evidence. They um, are working towards analytic validity to check the accuracy of the laboratory process used to perform the test and hopefully eventually clinical um, validity. So really the ability to test correctly and identify the health condition or disorder. And they also are using the Optum data, which is quite large. Go ahead, next slide, please. So, the question that I, that I would pose to this group is, is there a third circle? How do we take a basics, you know, th this great paradigm that has been developed to take the 
healthcare learning system within particular healthcare uh, si uh, systems and partner with insurance companies or partner with a with Optum and work more broadly to think about a framework, a framework for rare diseases, a framework where there might be less stringent criteria for diagnosis and treatment. What evidence do we need to develop policy and standard guidelines for people with rare disorders? Is there something other than randomized clinical control trials that we can prove? Can we as a community agree on what the outcomes should be that we're measuring after gene therapy or how we determine a change in therapy and the natural history of diseases? How do, we, um, how do we determine what the best outcome is for a rare disease? And you guys have talked a lot today about the implementation science and decision tools and how important that is. So I think looking across the healthcare system, thinking about patient experience and um, population screening, and mostly if we can impact CMS or Medicaid rules, even though they vary from state to state, I think we'll have the ability then to impl impact the insurers. So I'll just pause there and see if people have general questions and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much, Nancy. We do in fact have a little bit of time for any clarifying questions. I think um, I think the questions I'm seeing in the chat, we might want to hold until the discussion, but I do see Terry's hand is raised. Yes, um, thanks thanks so much, Nancy. I, I wonder you, when you mentioned that policy doesn't equal coverage, could, could you just expand a little bit on what you mean by policy and how the research community would contribute to it? Yeah, I mean, I think there's general policy and then there are each individual insurance products that dictate whether or not coverage happens. So you may have a policy uh, for whole genome sequencing um, that says whole genome sequencing is equal to whole exome sequencing in terms of um, ability and coverage, but, but payment um, and coverage does not include whole genome. So some companies, some individual uh, ASOs may elect to have whole genome sequencing covered. So it may be in what they call their uh, particular insurance document that dictates that coverage is there, but the policy in general doesn't include whole genome sequencing, if that's helpful. And how, um, how we can influence that as a community is, to, and to change policy is to have very clear outcomes and guidelines that show when we should be using a particular test or a particular capability. So we don't have a lot of guidelines about when to use whole genome versus whole exome. And that I think would go a long way towards influencing policy, if that's helpful. Yeah, very much so, thank you. Thank you. And Nancy, I had a quick clarifying question as well. Sure. You talked about um, the new study that's evaluating um, the, the improved outcomes and economic impact, focusing on those seven rare diseases. Mm -hmm. Could you just say a little bit about the, the rationale or criteria for selecting those particular um, diseases? Yeah, I was, I'm not part of that study directly. So, I mean, I advise them, so I can't speak to it. I think the idea was to try and get um, a smattering of diseases that some are on newborn screening, some are not, some we have good uh, treatment for, some we don't, so that we can have a broader understanding of the impact of diagnosis and treatment. Perfect, thank you. Okay. That was terrific. Let's move on to our final speaker, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. 
So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Daryl Pritchard from the Personalized Medicine Coalition. Daryl will cover progress in the integration of personalized medicine and common metrics. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Erin. Um, uh, I'll follow up the discussions about the learning health system and payers and about generating evidence of effectiveness and value that Howard uh, discussed with a short presentation on the progress toward the integration of personalized medicine within the broader US healthcare system, especially regarding metrics related to a genomic learning health system. So first, I wanna thank our host NHGRI uh, for leading the Genomics Medicine Workstream uh, in this 14th uh, edition, with special thanks to Pat DeVerka and Terry Manolio for inviting me to participate to give this presentation to the group. Thanks, guys. Um, thank you, Aaron and Crystal, and thanks to Renee Ryder and the whole group uh, of all of you uh, for all of your efforts to lead this meeting and to advance genomics in clinical settings. Really appreciate this effort. I, as Erin had introduced me, am Daryl Pritchard, Senior Vice President of Science Policy at the Personalized Medicine Coalition based in Washington, DC. And I'm going to describe an effort to assess the current landscape of clinical integration of personalized medicine and genomics in the US healthcare system. Now, during his opening keynote presentation yesterday morning, Peter Hulick introduced this effort. He, he provided a couple of slides that uh, I that might seem familiar to you because I have them in my slide deck as well. Um, and he briefly discussed how it provides a measure of readiness for a genomic learning health system and a measure of progress in genomics integration needed to further build out the, the learning health system. And this is key to the, the conversation, how uh, these measures that I'm going to discuss really kind of show the readiness and progress for uh, genomics integration in, in a learning health system. Uh, this initiative was designed to look at integration throughout the U.S. healthcare system at large, so it's not just early adopters and academic health centers, centers with well-funded research programs, but rather it includes a representative sample of healthcare delivery institutions uh, across the United States. So the objective of the study was to assess the adoption of personalized medicine across health systems in the U.S., what makes it different is it includes a broad survey across different hospital systems, different geographies, therapeutic areas, and adoption levels, um, and involves a multifactorial definition of personalized medicine or genomics adoption. Beyond just testing, it includes data utilization, um, uh, consistency, data sharing, leadership, funding, health equity, and other things. A critical outcome of the study was the development of a, of a novel maturity model to design to objectively measure personalized medicine adoption across the health system and was published in the Journal of Personalized Medicine last year. And it involves interrogation of each system's unique, um, unique uh, fingerprint on various metrics which can highlight specific challenges and potential solutions and hopefully this will be insightful for the development of a learning health system. Now, I've learned through many presentations to, to uh, not bury the lead. So I'm gonna provide the, the, the findings overall first and then get a little bit more into detail. Uh, what we were able to do was develop that novel maturity model designed to really objectively measure uh, genomics adoption across health systems. Um, on the top line, about 83% of institutions studied scored a two or higher on a five-point scale when we examined their integration efforts. And that's, um, that's important to note because that means that uh, personalized medicine and genomics is being recognized and adopted at some level pretty much across the board in the U.S. at this system. So we, we, we're having uh, some level of genomics adoption throughout the system, and that's a, a positive. However, only 22% of institutions scored a four or five on the personalized medicine integration scale. And I think as I describe the scale a little bit more, you'll see that these, this is where we need to get institutions to be in order to be considered part of a learning health system. Uh, the distribution of the overall level of personalized medicine integration was broken down by different cut types of healthcare institutions, different practice types and demographics, as well as other criteria. So just quickly looking at uh, the, the setup so we know who, we're, what kind of systems we're looking at when we're talking about adoption of personalized medicine and genomics. 
Uh, virtually all of the respondents uh, were actively involved in personalized medicine initiatives, uh, and they were representing a, a, a various set of roles within the healthcare system. Most, most of the respondents were lab directors or uh, C-suite executives in different health delivery system uh, administrative groups. Um, you can see here on the right, uh, the breakdown by type of health system, whether it was a health system, an independent hospital, or an integrated delivery network, such as Intermountain Healthcare and, and Geisinger. Um, they uh, uh, are represented uh, pretty much uh, as are represented across the country as well. Uh, the demographics of uh, the different systems that were involved, you can see the breakdown. We had roughly about a third of our respondents were academic health centers, a third were community teaching uh, hospitals, and uh, a little more than a third were community non-teaching hospitals. And that's important as we look at the differences that may occur in adoption between these types of, of, of systems. Uh, we ranged from, from large systems to single hospital systems, and we had a nice breakdown regionally across the United States. Uh, organizations were evaluated based on the level of personalized me medicine integration across five key clinical areas, including oncology, rare and undiagnosed disease, which Nancy just talked about, uh, pharmacogenomics, uh, prenatal or neonatal screening, and even healthy patient screening was a place where we're still developing and still needs a considerable work towards clinical adoption. But we evaluated PM adoption across these areas and, and developed uh, through a weighted system, a score which then was used to assign a level of integration from one to five. Uh, this slide was uh, shared by Peter Hewlett yesterday as well. Um, and it shows the multifactorial set of uh, criteria that we established to assess personalized medicine adoption, uh, eight different independent dimensions, um, including different types of information that are collected and utilized, how they're processed and accessed and utilized, uh, whether it's data sharing and, and how, the, how programs are structured. Uh, for this conversation, I'm going to focus on a couple of these independent dimensions, uh, the first being the collection of genomic data, because these are the ones that are uh, most relevant to a genomic learning health system. Uh, secondly, our fourth uh, independent dimension, testing guidance and data accessibility, and lastly, data sharing. Before I get into that, let me show you the overall integration. Uh, as I mentioned, most of the systems, you see a little bell curve here, most of the systems scored a two or a three, and that's great news. And genomics are being integrated throughout the US health system, community hospitals, as well as academic health centers at some level. Uh, but you can also see that there are far fewer, that far fewer healthcare delivery institutions that are um, scoring at the level of four or five. And, and again, I think this is the level that we're going to need to get our health systems to in order to be considered and really a part of a learning health system uh, that shares data externally. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, just a breakdown, because I think this will be of interest to the group of, of how these scores played out. Uh, you can see this uh, through our academic versus community versus community teaching, where the scores broke down, where the levels broke down. Uh, health system, independent hospitals, and integrated delivery networks in the middle, and then the suburban, rural, and uh, urban breakdown uh, uh, based on, on region. Uh, most of this is what you would expect. What, uh, a couple of interesting that things that came out, as you can see uh, all the way to the left, that, that academic health centers uh, really had very, very few that were um, scoring at low levels, especially at a level uh, one. Uh, really, academic health centers are at least uh, integrating personalized medicine and genomics um, at, at a higher level than some other community health care systems. But you see the level of four or fives are pretty consistent, whether it's a community system or an academic health care system uh, ac across our sample. Um, you also see, I, just to, I'll mention that the rural versus suburban and urban breakdown shows that most of the rural systems uh, have scored at a level two or three. Um, but this is also a feature of the fact that we are only able to get six 
rural systems in our out of our 153 that were sampled. Um, so that means four of those scored a three and two of them scored a two. So a uh, little bit sparse data for looking at the rural community hospitals. Now, uh, to talk about the genomic integration, uh, real quick, I just wanted to show that uh, health systems were assessed both on the breadth and the consistency of their genetic testing, whether or not they were uh, implementing uh, multi-gene testing or, or exome sequencing or genome sequencing. And you can see that, uh, uh, that, that at least some physicians were ordering testing or, or most physicians were ordering testing, multi-gene testing across the board. And the breakdown for this across different clinical areas shows that uh, while oncology is receiving the most genomic testing uh, of the five disciplines we looked at, uh, it's across the board the genetic testing is um, genetic testing is being uh, implemented. Uh, there's been uh, more broad targeting and, and whole exome and whole genome sequencing in oncology and rare undiagnosed disease than in areas like pharmacogenomics and, and prenatal testing. Um, but this shows a nice breakdown of where we are as far as genomic testing is being implemented. Wanted to get into testing guidance and data accessibility, and we measured this uh, through whether or not systems were manually ordering testing, whether um, they were uh, pathways or clinical protocols in place through the electronic health record that then prompted a doctor to uh, input or, uh, or, or develop results for biomarker testing uh, and, and genomic testing within place, or whether there were results automatically integrated into the electronic health record. And you can see that um, across the board, that about a quarter of the and this is the, the top thing, about a quarter of the systems that we looked at had pathways or protocols in place that had results automatically integrated into electronic health records. Uh, this was uh, slightly less in pharmacogenomics, uh, but uh, for most disciplines, we're seeing uh, only about uh, 20 to 25% of institutions that are, are uh, at that level of integration. However, we are seeing a, a promising look at having electronic health records uh, prompting physicians to do testing in certain areas. Lastly, I wanted to show the data on data sharing um, that we came across, and we measured this by whether data was being shared internally within a department, internally within an organization, or externally. And I think it's important to note that the external sharing is really where we're gonna to need to be to uh, develop a learning health system. As, as Peter Hewlett uh, defined a learning health system yesterday, um, it's a system in which internal data and experience are systematically integrated with external evidence. And this knowledge is put to use for, to practice to get patients higher quality, safer care. Um, this external sharing is gonna be necessary and it's one of our key challenges, which we can discuss. Shown here uh, in all of the disciplines where we're seeing data sharing occur, uh, we're doing a, a, a decent job, uh, especially data that's shared within institutions and within departments, but we could do a much better job at external uh, data sharing. Uh, external data sharing is only occurring in between 10 to 25% of the institutions that we were able to look at, uh, which I think is a representative look across the US healthcare system. Uh, with slightly more about 25% in oncology. So the conclusions that, uh, and there's a lot more to this study, but the conclusions for this discussion that I can get to is, is just that based on the survey of representative samples of, of uh, healthcare providers revealed a system-wide but incomplete push to implement personalized medicine in clinical practice. This, I believe underlines both the momentum that the field has as well as the limitations associated with the utilization of new technologies. US health systems are making great progress, but we must build on this momentum in order to raise all healthcare delivery institutions to the highest levels that will be needed for a learning health system, an effective learning health system. Now also uh, a key conclusion is that 
by interrogating each of these systems unique adoption fingerprint, we can highlight specific challenges and discuss potential solutions that may be insightful for the assessment of progress and for the development of a genomics learning health system. And this includes, but isn't limited to the collection of genomic data, uh, the, the test result database automation and data sharing. Daryl, so you're out of time. Oh, thank you. With that, I'll leave you and uh, take questions and get into the panel discussion with Howard and Nancy. Thank you so much, Daryl. That was terrific. Before I turn it over to Crystal to moderate the general discussion, were there any quick clarifying questions for Daryl? I don't see any in the chat. Okay, I'll turn it over to you, Crystal. And if we could have all the uh, videos for our speakers turned on, terrific. All right, thank you so much. If you are able to, could you please uh, drop your questions in the Q&A? That way we don't lose the questions in the chat. Uh, there's some amazing discussion going on, but I just wanna make sure that we don't miss anything. But I also acknowledge that if you're a panelist or a moderator, you may not be able to use the Q&A function in the same way. I wanna uh, start off with actually a quick, I think this is a clarifying, question or just a quick question from Nguyen Park directly to um, uh, Howard. And uh, just it just reads, Howard, does Intermountain work with Mountain State Regional Genetics Network? So at, on an individual level, there are uh, some of our folks uh, amongst our genetic counselors or, or genetic physicians that, uh, that do engage with them. Uh, but institutionally, we, uh, we we haven't. No, nothing against them. Just haven't. Uh, haven't. Haven't. Just haven't had a need. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm kind of going uh, uh, in in order of when where I saw this in the chat. So I do apologize if it seems like I am prioritizing one speaker over another. But I also do want to uh, highlight Adam Berger's question. Uh, has there been exploration of the intersection of genetic services and CMS alternative payment models as an incentive for adoption? Uh, APMs are meant to incentivize payment for provision of high quality cost efficient care. Daryl, I know that you entered a response in the chat. Um, would you mind uh, reiterating what you stated? And then I'll also open it up to both Howard and Nancy. Sure. Um, and, and thank you, Adam, for the question. Uh, it is something that uh, the Personalized Medicine Coalition and the whole community, all of us have been thinking about. How can we leverage this value-based um, response and the new evidence that we're developing that shows the greater value of personalized care and of genomics to CMS and to others that are key decision makers so that we can have you know, better access to these technologies? And I think the key challenge is just in that, in the evidence, and, and Howard talked about this at, at what Intermountain has established, but a lot of these data points that show value, that show an economic benefit, require long-term outcome measures. So you're looking at a lifetime, because the costs for a treatment, uh, a targeted treatment may be uh, more expensive than um, small molecule treatments that have been traditional care. And because the cost of diagnostics is added to that, upfront the costs may be higher, but we are showing that this is leading to reduced costs downstream. But we need to have that long-term data. We need to take a look at endpoints that are five years, 10 years, or lifetime down the road. And that's what's been difficult to come at. Most of this evidence that we have is based on models. And these are good models, good cost effectiveness and clinical utility models that show uh, improved value that will be useful for CMS and others. Uh, but that data is still sparse because we, uh, we're, we're accumulating it and we're, we're doing these models. This includes in oncology, rare and undiagnosed disease and in pharmacogenomics. But we're seeing that evidence develop now. And I think more and more, we're starting to move the needle and push those decision makers into recognition of that value. Thank you so much for those comments, Daryl. I also want to acknowledge that the timing of this question coincided with actually Howard's talk. So Howard, do you have any further comments or 
Um, would you like to elaborate on, on that question? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I mean, Daryl's hit it pretty well. I think, you know, CMS has been, um, it's been a bit mixed engaging with CMS. You know, on the one hand, they have to be involved with innovation um, because they're going to ultimately pay for it. Uh, but um, they also don't want innovation because they're going to ultimately pay for it. So it's it's a, a group that we've tried to engage with a little bit more clearly. Um, there are times when there's some champions there that it goes better than others. But overall, we just we've ended up just deciding, you know, most of this we're going to do ourselves, and then uh, we'll work with CMS um, as we're able. But we can't rely on them um, because there's not a consistent path to go forward. Thank you. And Nancy, I also want you to have an opportunity to respond as well, if, you, if you'd like. Sure, thank you. I mean, wasn't there, there was something that was called um, the Medicare coverage of innovative technology, a 2021 proposal. And I think, I think it was uh, repealed. Um, I don't know how we get them to consider it again, but that might be helpful. That was one thought. And the other thought I have is that, you know, when they do the health economic outcome studies, often they're looking at a 12 to 17 month out, outcome, not um, over years, because that's how often people switch insurances. So it's, a, it's you know, you're caught betwixt and between. And if we can try and do some studies that look at that short term financial gain by getting a diagnosis sooner, saving testing, um, decreasing hospitalizations and emergency room visits, having people not continue to look, I think that would go a long way as well. Thank you so much. Uh, this, this question comes from Erin. Uh, Howard, does Intermountain share aggregate variant pathogenicity dissertations with ClinVar? It, it does. And the you know, as we're getting more of our data back, um, we're, we're working through the process of what, what can we share? So we do a whole a research whole genome in a CLIA environment, but it's not CLIA, and then follow up with CLIA sequencing. So um, I think Aaron and I are hopefully gonna be talking sometime in the near future. Um, that'll be one of the you know, topics, you know, is it worth putting our research grade data in there, realizing that not all of it will validate, which at the moment we're not putting that in. So you know, kind of, I guess, is the answer to the question. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Jeff actually had a couple questions. The first question was directed more toward Nancy, and I see that she answered that in the chat already. So I'm gonna go directly to Jeff's second question. As we move toward population screening, how do we address the issues that underinsured patients or those who have no insurance will need medical services, um, i.e. mammography, colonoscopy, after finding a pathogenic variant? And that one is to the group. Any thoughts on how do we ensure, if, and Jeff, please, um, if you'd like to, to chime in and perhaps clarify or add a little bit more details to the question. Um, my interpretation of this is um, as we are moving toward population screening, like this to me seems more of an equity question and ensuring that patients who are already underinsured or underserved actually are able to um, access these services when, it, when they determine that they have a pathogenic variant. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, that was uh, that's uh, spot on, and I'm I was thinking. Uh, well, we've had um, discussions in North Carolina about doing large scale um, precision health screening uh, for tier one disorders, and this issue always comes up about uh, going into a community that you know that may not have the right um, support from from payers. And I was also curious as to Howard, as you've launched your large scale program, have you run into this issue, and how have you dealt with it? Yeah, so thanks, Jeff. So on the population health side, because we have a lot of value-based care, including uh, Medicare Advantage, I saw Rob had, had a question in there on that, um, a lot of the precision health approaches uh, pay off really pretty quickly in a, in a, uh, a value-based uh, system. Uh, you, you, you get to own the value. You're not just transferring the value onto someone else. Um, and so uh, what we found is... is um, 
in in the context of especially of, of rural populations, uh, which do overlap with, um, for, for example, some of them have a lot of in our area have a lot of Native American um, um, groups, um, some Hispanic, um, a lot of Polynesian in uh, across U uh, rural Utah. Um, there, uh, there we get some extra value in that we're able to find things earlier. Uh, we're able to benefit that because we're we're holding the risk. Um, on that patient's care. Um, and so by reducing the risk, we're able to intervene in a better way. Um, there's the issues with rural uh, fo uh, folks and with uh, the those without that are economic disadvantaged um, has been that they have not been treated well in the past. And so there's a lot of work needed to make sure that they see that there's value for them. But as a, as a health system, at least one that's not completely addicted to fee-for-service, um, it, it is not hard to make the case where Population screening, population health strategy um, can can be um, economically um, favorable. So, Howard, are you saying that that more health systems should take should take risk on these populations, and then they'll be able to provide more care for people that are in rural situations or underserved? So, we're we are we have a lot of our population that it, that we hold the risk, mm -hmm. and within that group. Um, so I haven't done the actuarial work to say we should go out and look for one group or another, but yeah. within the groups where we hold the risk, it pays off to do that. Now, there's a lot of overlap um, because of the way our, our health system is designed with rural uh, rural populations and with some of the um, historically um, or currently uh, disadvantaged uh, groups um, so uh, or neglected groups. So, so there is a high overlap there, um, but I think, you know, there are people much uh, much smarter than me that can do analyses to say uh, what the business case is for seeking out you know, one population versus another. I think it's great. Yeah, uh, let me I, chime in and, and I'll just say that a lot of these patient screening programs are really pilot programs at this point. And I see Mark Williams um, with his hand raised and I'm sure he'll talk about the micro project at uh, Geisinger. But uh, again, to scale this up, which has been a big part of this conversation, we're going to need the data uh, to show that there's an economic benefit. And I think Howard just laid it out perfectly. If you're talking about at-risk populations where you're doing screening, then I think that value proposition will be clear. But when we're talking about full population screening, we, we need to show that there, there is um, a, a cost effectiveness to it. Uh, and, and I'm not sure we're there yet. Thank you. I do want to um, give Mark the opportunity to respond. And thank you for having your hand up. No problem. Um, and thanks, uh, Daryl, for the lead in there. Um, yeah, I wanted to just talk a little bit about this from the MyCode uh, uh, Geisinger perspective. Uh, of course, we're uh, set up very much the way um, Intermountain is um, in terms of our uh, uh, integration. Um, what that means is that for people that participate in MyCode, which is open to any uh, individual, any patient that receives care at Geisinger, about 40% of those are covered by our health plan. And we uh, pre-negotiated with our health plan that any recommended medical care that would come from uh, the MyCode recommendations when we identify an individual with a variant would be covered. So we, at least for the 40% where we had the responsibility um, we uh, said that uh, we would uh, make sure that our health plan covered it. Now, of course, there are other issues like co-pays and uh, deductibles that also can sometimes lead to uh, people's inability to uh, get the needed care. Uh, that's something that we can't address as much. We also, um, for all the initial return of results in that, that was all covered by the research project. So there's no out-of-pocket costs to any participant in my code for that initial return of results and for the transition into care. In terms of the really challenging issue of the, uh, that is you know, not limited to genomics, but that there's a lot of people that can't get the care they need because they're uninsured or underinsured, we have at least made available all of the programs that are available within our institution uh, to help people that have uh, difficulties to obtain uh, uh, needed care because of financial um, uh, challenges, they have the same access to those services as, it, as any other patient. So 
but there are um, IRS rules that don't allow <laughs> differential application of those types of programs. So we have to follow the, uh, those eligibility rules, but we do make sure that we help navigate them to those services uh, so that they can, um, uh, we can do as much as we can to eliminate that type of disparity. Thank you so much. And I do want to uh, uh, address Josh Peterson's question in the Q&A. Um, just reading this question for Daryl. Surprising to see the re re relatively robust implementation across different types of hospitals seems to be a big improvement. Any concern about response bias or are rural hospitals adopting quickly? Can you give us an idea of what a level five health system looks like? Sure, and thanks for the question, Jeff. So uh, as I mentioned, there was 153 hospital systems that were of all different types that were part of the, the survey that led to that framework development. So really, I think with that kind of end, we're, we're, we're minimizing bias. However, uh, I also mentioned that with the rural systems in particular, uh, they were self-identified as rural system. And we only had of the 153 systems, six that self-identified as a rural community hospital system. So there is a definite chance for bias from that particular cohort. Um, and as I mentioned, most of them uh, measured a three, um, and I think that would be considered terrific if the uh, bulk of all of our rural hospital systems across America were um, uh, measuring at a level three on a scale of one to five in genomics implementation. I'm not sure that that's true. I think um, the ones that we had in our system were that, um, but it was very difficult to reach them. Um, an example of a, a level five system would really be a system that has programs and personalized medicine programs in place or genomics medicine programs in place with all of the genetic counseling, with all of the data integration that we've been talking about throughout the conference for the last two days um, in place and actionable. They're sharing data uh, internally and externally to help drive clinical practices and pathways forward that, in, that increase our knowledge of genomics in clinical care and utilize it for better patient care, safety, and efficacy. Um, some examples would be like the Mayo Clinic. They've been doing this for a long, long time. We need to move our baseline closer and closer to those levels of four and five. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um... Just also wanting to address uh, Rob Raleigh's question in the in the chat at Howard. What has your been been your success with Medicare Advantage plans versus direct Medicare coverage? Yeah, so uh, we we kind of hit on that a little bit with some of the early discussion. Um, Medicare Advantage uh, is uh, is is on its surface uh, seems like a place where personalized medicine would not be conducted. Uh, because of, of the excess cost that brings in with the testing. Um, we've been able to work through both on the oncology side as well as on the, um, the geriatric and, and uh, chronic disease management sites um, where, where there could be benefit. And what we found is in the oncology side, by able to select medicines and by identifying which could be oral versus IV medications, um, there's different implications on which budgets those come out of. And so um, suddenly when they realized that there was po some positive budget implications, they became big fans of, of, uh, of tumor testing. Same thing on the pharmacogenomic side, by, by demonstrating where the benefits are. By now there's a little bit more data out there. We have some of our internal data. Um, that, that's allowed the discussion to be less theoretical and more practical. And I think that's kind of held the field back a bit as we have this theoretical idea of what it could mean. As, as Geisinger and as other groups come out with real data, um, so we no longer have to, to guess what is going to happen, um, we're, we're now seeing that the decisions are, are being made in a much more practical manner. And, and uh, more often than not, leads to adoptions of the adopt, adoption of the technology. Great. Thank you. And Mark also can speak to Medicare Advantage. Yeah, we um, uh, have the advantage of uh, our health insurance plan actually having a Medicare Advantage offering. And so our discussions with our health plan also included 
the Medicare Advantage uh, plans, um, which was really important since the median age of the folks that are in our MyCode, uh, uh, that are participating in MyCode is in, in the 60s. So it's, it's definitely a population where uh, over half are uh, of uh, Medicaid el eligibility. And we have a significant number of those that are enrolled in Medicare Advantage. So um, the uh, other advantage of Medicare Advantage is it allows for coverage of preventive services, which are generally excluded from traditional Medicare. Um, but you have to do it within the constraints of how much um, uh, available premium dollar you have for things that would go beyond Medicare coverage. And of course, if Medicare says you explicitly can't cover something, then you can't. Um, but it does give more flexibility. And so we have been able to extend uh, coverage for medical services that derive from a variant identified in my code to individuals that have our Medicare Advantage plan. But of course, that doesn't have any impact on the other Medicare Advantage offerings uh, that, are, uh, that might provide coverage for people in our area. But that also allows us to collect data to say, is this really a good use of the uh, preventive funds that are available through Medicare Advantage? All right, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna kick it to Alana. She's, uh, she, they uh, says, I would like the panel to discuss not just the cost effectiveness, but the effectiveness of engaging individuals in meaningful care after receiving a result. Do any of our speakers have a comment? So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump in first, I guess. Uh, so that's a very important, for really practically, if we don't achieve what that question was going after, then kind of who cares about the rest of it? Um, it's, it's just uh, something for a symposium, not for, a, for a really moving the needle. Um, and so um, we've had to do some things differently. You know, we have the classical genetic counseling, um, way forward, tele and otherwise. But we've set up some, some separate clinics that are all telemedicine based um, where uh, they're, one of them is a longitudinal uh, care um, model uh, where we're looking at a, basically a medical home for those who have high genetic risk. Um, and it's hard to find those out there. You know, typically the, the clinics are very episodic or they're more triage based. Um, Nephi Walton also set up a more of a triage based clinic. So we get whole genome data. One can identify what needs to be chased and then refer to specialists who are ready for that diagnosis. Not every neurologist knows what to do with someone who has a high genetic risk of, of early onset Parkinson's, uh, but is 37 years of age. You know, so that, that sort of thing, um, getting to the right specialist is there. Um, and, and so at least in our hands, we've had to set up new clinics that really were more fit for purpose rather than using the traditional models. Um, and then lastly, supporting the primary care folks. So when they do want to take it on, um, making sure that we have their back um, in real time. And you know, Tela has really changed a lot of that. You know, we're able to get a specialist into a room um, for a few minutes as needed um, if it's, you know, if it's prearranged. And so um, I think it's just I mean, a case of responding to that need um, as opposed to, you know, how do we fit people into the way we've been doing it for a while? Um, and that just, it just doesn't work. We, we're going to have to, every, everybody that's talked, uh, that's on the session has been talking about new things that they've had to do um, uh, over, the, uh, over the last year even. Um, and that's going to be the story really for the next five years. Great, thank you. Uh, do either Daryl or Nancy have any other uh, elaborations on that point? Yes, I do. Uh, thanks, Crystal. And thanks for the question. Um, just to, to follow up some of what Howard just mentioned. A lot of these um, studies that we're looking at to show value uh, are, we're, we're talking about them in the way of focusing on the cost effectiveness, but they are designed as clinical and cost effectiveness mm -hmm. studies. And that clinical effectiveness, that clinical utility piece is the primary piece as, as Howard mentioned. Without that, even the cost effectiveness doesn't matter. Well, the reason why we're talking about cost effectiveness so much is because we're, we're talking about access and we're trying to um, show evidence that patients should have access to this care. So we're, we're driving those messages towards those stakeholders that control access to these technologies, payers and providers. That's what the cost effectiveness really goes to. 
But the most important stakeholder in this is the patient and the clinical effectiveness and that clinical utility piece is what really matters uh, to them. It's also important, obviously, to providers and payers and industry and all stakeholders. Uh, and, and we're really trying to show that. Now, the projects and programs to show clinical and cost effectiveness that I've been a part of and that I've seen coming through the personalized medicine and genomics um, uh, uh, community have shown great clinical effectiveness. However, you know, this has been, again, it's been uh, shown very clearly in rare and undiagnosed disease, um, somewhat in pharmacogenomics. And then again, it's been clear in oncology. Uh, but one of the things that we've also seen is we're not realizing the full clinical utility or the full clinical effectiveness of these technologies because of policy problems, including access problems, and because of practice-based problems. It's not being used. There's not enough education. Some of the things that we've been talking today about what we can improve through a learning health system that will make will, will help optimize this strategy and will help improve that clinical utility. If we look at all of these issues and address them, then yes, we will have a clear picture of great clinical effectiveness that you know, will be undeniable for patients going forward. That's really helpful. Thank you. I mean, I have to admit earlier, I was typing an answer to something else and missed part of what you said, Howard. Sorry. <laughs> the, the one thing that I would add is we, um, we often measure uh, a net promoter score, NPS, which is sort of like a, a customer satisfaction score. So an NPS score in, in Disney World is, you know, over 80. Um, and uh, in one of the programs that I was part of uh, previously, um, our special needs initiative, we started out with an NPS of, uh, in the negative range, like negative 100, and got up to 70. So we considered that a huge win and really seeking to understand what it was that our members slash patients, which took me a long time to call people members instead of patients, um, actually need and want. So I think including that in our studies might go a long way. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Howard, this next question is directed toward you, but I think all three of uh, our speakers can possibly comment as well on this, considering the relatedness to the question we were just discussing. Um, Howard, could you comment on the possibility of sharing data related to cost savings using personalized medicine initiatives in your health system with payers to help shape future policy? Yeah, so there, there's um, some of that data we are trying to get out into the public domain. Um, either via white papers or via publications, but there's a, a lag that occurs there. Um, there isn't a forum that we've found so far where we can share that data in uh, a safe enough way uh, to allow people to see it, but not give away um, all the trade secrets and, and the elements that some of our leadership doesn't want to give away. Um, and so that, that's been the, you know, the, the difficulty is trying to like, how do we make sure that the field benefits from, from that, um, but, but, not, um, but, but not compromise the institution's ability to be competitive going forward. Um, and so that, you know, some, some of the savings we're talking about is the secret sauce for having a, pro, a profitable margin in negotiations, you know? So it's, uh, you know, that's kind of the, the hidden thing with precision medicine is a lot of that is secret sauce. It's the reason why we can do Medicare Advantage and not uh, lose money um, because we're identifying risk and mitigating it. You know, so um, I think that that's we we do need to find a forum where we can better share these things um, because you know academic publications are fine. We all do a lot of that, um, but you know the lag time is too great. And and you know frankly, you know, there are very few journals that want the kinds of things we're talking about today. You know, it's fascinating to me that you say that the leadership doesn't want to share because when I listen to you and to Mark, these two places that have been so successful, right, in showing a, um, a shared cost savings and being able to move the field forward are places where your health insurance is part of your health system. Yeah. And that is really powerful. Um, I think the partnership between a health system and a health insurer to share in the savings is um, part of the reality that allows this to move forward. 
it's great. It helps the patients and it, it helps the members. It's it's the uh, the push and the pull of the difficulty of the U.S. health system because it's a business here in this country. Yeah. And uh, and that's tough because none of us went into medicine to be part of business. We went into medicine as physicians and genetic counselors and PhDs to help people and be clinically active. So how do we how do we lean into that? find the savings, find a way to share in it so that we can best move the field forward and care for more people and get them supported. Seeing some head nods of Daryl, I, I definitely want to hear your thoughts. Thanks, Crystal. And um, thank you, Nancy and Howard. Uh, this is actually part of the mission of the Personalized Medicine Coalition. So it's my job to do a better job of, uh, of, of spreading this word of accumulating this evidence and bringing it forward to the appropriate stakeholders. And Howard uh, McLeod is on board of directors for PMC. So uh, we work together a, a lot and I've worked with the Intermountain team um, with Howard and Lincoln to, to move forward a lot of the data they've done. But we also build this data through projects, that we, really community-wide projects. And part of our strategy of doing cost effectiveness and clinical effectiveness studies is to involve a payer advisory group. We have a health data, a healthcare working group, which consists of providers and we have patient advisory groups as well. But by including a payer advisory group, when we develop these projects to show this evidence, to use real world practice-based evidence to show improved value in a personalized medicine and genomics approach, uh, we can, bring the plan to our payer advisory committee up front and make sure that it's going to be meaningful to payers. If we do something that payers don't feel is credible or don't feel is providing the evidence they need for their decision-making, then, then we don't want to do it. We want to make sure that we involve them early in those discussions so that we can, uh, we can, we can move the uh, needle with our impact of these studies. Great, great comments. I, I, I want to focus on a question that's um, directed to you, Daryl. Any plans to repeat the survey you presented and track changes over time and reasons for increasing implementation? Thanks, and I saw that, uh, that question from Pat. So thank you, Pat, for the question. Um, so there's two things we can do and we hope to. One is to update the, the, the survey so that we can show progress over time. And that's a, a plan we're working on. I wanna thank uh, Gary Gustafson and the team at Health Advances that's helping us do that, uh, that work. Um, and I think that's something that we hope to do within the next couple of years. Uh, that'll give us a good sense of how things are progressing, how things looked in 2021 and how they'll look, and actually that data was from 2019, how that will look in 2023 or 2022. Um, uh, to, to, to show our progress and to show different elements because there are these individual fingerprints that we can look at to show what progress has been made in those different elements of the, the personalized medicine score. The second thing we can do is fine tune this, this as a tool to look more at a genomic learning health system and make sure that this framework for our adoption scores um, is, is built with the genomic learning health system in mind. So we can ask more questions about genetic counseling, about health equity, about data sharing, and try to drill down a little more to inform this particular effort for the, the, the that NHGRI is doing for the development of a, a genomics learning health system. So I think both are, are things I would like to discuss with all of you. Um, we do plan on doing the update, I'd also like to talk about how to, to make this absolutely relevant and impactful for a genomic learning health system. So hopefully have those conversations to up and coming. Well, that sounded like an opening if, if Nancy and Howard had any thoughts before we go to our last question. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that Daryl does that <laughs> and doesn't ask me to do any of the work. <laughs> Just, just advise, Howard, I want you to, to always be involved. I think it's great. Thanks.
Thanks, Nancy. All right, well, great. Um, I think we're coming on our last question and this is coming directly for, from Erin, but it seems to have elicited like quite a bit of interesting discussion in the chat. So I have asked Erin to re-ask her question to the group and um, perhaps in case there are any other questions, like please post them, but this might be the last one. Thanks, Crystal. You've been doing an amazing job. Yeah, so my question in the chat was directed at to Nancy um, because Nancy made an interesting point that the virtuous genomic learning healthcare system cycle could potentially have a third circle, which would talk about um, more direct interactions or collaborations with payers. So I asked Nancy for a little bit of advice on that. Uh, Mark weighed in, uh, but would love to hear Maybe Nancy expand and then Mark to follow up if you have any thoughts. Yeah, I was going to say I can start and I'm sure Mark will have more to add. He's uh, insightful about this and he always does. So <laughs> um, I guess. A oh, he's got a things. big mouth. That's the difference, uh, Nancy. But I appreciate your you're putting a positive spin on it. I always have. People always tell me I have a big mouth, Mark. It's OK. <laughs> um, so. A couple things. One is, you know, there's always the opportunity and, um, you know, uh, and, and likely a cost involved to be transparent to partner with Optum and the Optum data sets, which are very large. That's one possibility. The other possibility is to do as Howard um, and Mark have done, or as Daryl is suggesting, which is to engage a more local health system partner. So if you're a health system that is located in one particular part of the country, there's often a local network or, or a Medicaid provider or a private provider that may be interested. Um, I also think um, there are opportunities to partner with um, a particular company. So if you live in a state where there's a very large company that has their own health insurance, um, that would be a place to partner. In fact, I had one person from a very large testing company call me and say, how do we get whole genome sequencing covered? Because they wanted it covered. And I said, well, does your company cover it? <laughs> I mean, people... People, people forget, right? Like your own company, all these private companies, are they in, including the genetic testing and what is their approach to that? And then, um, uh, you know, um, I'm also in our system, certainly happy to connect people locally with who I know that may be willing, willing to partner as well. The one other thing I might add is, I think from, like a broader uh, research perspective, NHGRI, what should they be, you know, Terry's always saying to me, what should we be doing? What kind of research should we be doing so we can make sure we're getting the right answers? I think if, if some of the people that are leading in the field, the people that are on this network can help us ask the right questions, that might be helpful. So one thing that bothers me is who is an expert in what and how do you define it? Can we create some standards around that? Um, you know, those kinds of questions and helping to address answers for those that are very that are basic and can create some infrastructure we can all build on would be very helpful. So I'll just pause there. So I'll, I'll I will take the um, opportunity to just add a little bit. I, I wanted to. Um, explain a bit more on some of the issues of alignment. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, uh, I think one of the reasons why some of the leaders in the, uh, the personalized precision medicine area are integrated systems like uh, a Kaiser or an Intermountain or a Geising or others is because we can have discussions where we have uh, clinicians and we have uh, the hospital and we can have the payer all sitting around the same table. And if we take a condition like Lynch syndrome, um, you know, we say, well, we identify this individual who has a variant in, in Lynch syndrome. And if we enhance surveillance, then we may be able to prevent a cancer in this individual. Uh, and the payer says, well, okay, we might agree with that, but that might be 10 or 15 years down the road. And to Nancy's earlier point, we may not be insuring that person at that time. Um, and so it's gonna incur a cost, but we're not gonna realize a benefit. But if you're in an integrated system, the uh, 
clinician can say, well, wait a second, we're going to generate some revenue because we're going to have more colonoscopies that we're going to be doing. And if those are done in an outpatient surgery center or in a hospital facility, the facility is going to generate some revenue there. So in an integrated system, you could say, okay, health plan, you're going to take a little bit of a loss on this, but we're going to make it up on the procedure side. That's an indictment and you know, a reality of the United States healthcare system and how it works. But if you're a health, if you're an insurer that's just sitting off on your own, you're only going to see the cost. You're not going to be able to recover any sort of benefits because you're not aligned with those other systems. And that's where the, the problem really comes in, in terms of identifying how can we actually make an argument that uh, aligns the um, uh, strategies and values of these different organizations around this particular topic. Uh, I think it's possible, but it's a much harder conversation to have. Well, thank, thank you. you so, oh, are Go there ahead, Crystal. Other, oh, I was just going to ask if there are any other comments before I kick it to you. If there are none, feel free to hop in, Erin. Thank you all. Yeah, wonderful. Um, Crystal, and I can't, Crystal and I can't thank our speakers enough for your great presentations. We have a terrific set of questions and discussion. Um, so I'll just, I will summarize my, the main points that I captured, and then if any of our um, speakers or Crystal wants to add anything, that would be terrific, and then we can wrap up and take a break before our next session. So we heard from Howard some specific examples where um, precision medicine, um, reduce costs and improve outcomes. I think, well, we should continue to catalog and disseminate these advances. We talked about not just the cost savings, but more importantly, the value and the meaningful impact that this has on patients. Nancy emphasized the challenges and opportunities to leverage the uh, genomic learning health system to support people with rare disease, uh, highlighting the, the economic burden estimate to be at over a trillion dollars. Uh, we also heard that policy does not equal coverage. Coverage is determined by uh, different insurance entities. Um, and Nancy reminded us about the hierarchy of evidence to develop coverage policies. So as a community, we need to have clear outcomes and guidelines showing, for example, when to order particular tests. This is critical in helping um, insurers make coverage decisions. The virtuous genomic learning healthcare system cycle could include more direct interactions and collaborations with payers, which is we just um, ended on that topic. And then we had some discussion on outcome measures. So Daryl summarized the PMC study and um, that was really enlightening. The adoption model covered eight main areas, um, generation collection of data, testing guidance, data sharing, leadership, et cetera. Um, there was some discussion on sort of what standard outcome metrics do we have within those categories and how the community can begin to use those more globally. Nancy mentioned the net customer um, satisfaction score but there's other metrics we should consider as a community using and capturing that information in a standard way. And then lastly, work to be done to able um, to follow people and their outcomes across insurance um, providers, especially this is especially important through the lens of, of health equity. So I will pause there. We have two minutes. Does anyone wanna add anything to that summary? Only a note of gratitude and really appreciate being part of this today and everybody helping us out. Agreed, thank you. Thanks, Nancy. I'll just uh, add my final comment that the data, the real world evidence and practice-based data is critical for this entire value proposition which we, which we raised today. We need uh, the real data and those real outcome measures um, in order to, to have an impact. Um, and, and I think we've done a great job, Travis Osterman, yesterday um, with, with Bob Dolan and, and Christopher Shute and Carol Block Bolt um, did a great job in talking about how we can leverage some data metrics. Um, it's key to this, uh, this endeavor for turning this into a, a learning health system. Thanks, Daryl. That's an important note to end on. So I think we are on time and we are now up for a 10 minute break and we'll be back at 3.10 for our next session. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal.